Tonight, Ukraine's surprise appearance on the world stage, Volodymyr Zelensky's dramatic appeal at the G7. The center of attention at a global summit. He's got himself into the G7. When you served all the, the normal agenda items for the G7, now it's focused on Ukraine. And the prime minister's face to face. As Russia claims a symbolic victory in Bakhmut. Wildfire risk on the west coast. We miss the smell of a good old campfire, but certainly don't mind. Burn bans in place during a cautious long weekend. Plus, the psychedelic pop-ups dispensing illegal drugs. You can't be selling these. This is drug trafficking. That's all this is. The crackdown on magic mushroom shops across Canada. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo. Reporting tonight, Heather Butts. Good evening. The red carpet was rolled out for Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky in Japan as he made his in-person push to G7 leaders for more weapons and support to fight off Russian aggression. Zelensky met with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who once again confirmed Canada stands with Ukraine. This after having one-on-one -on -one meetings with other G7 leaders today. CTV's senior political correspondent Glenn McGregor is in Hiroshima and starts us off. Hiroshima has seen a parade of leaders' jets arriving for the G7 summit, but none as anticipated as this French government plane touching down with Ukraine's president aboard. Vladimir Zelensky is a guest at this year's summit, where G7 leaders have made his country's struggle against Russia their top concern. This will overshadow almost certainly everything else that might come out of, uh, of the summit, and it's of tremendous significance, certainly for Ukraine, but also for the G7's efforts to counter uh, Russia's uh, aggression. The group today issued an early communique, promising to intensify their support for Ukraine and tighten existing sanctions against President Vladimir Putin's regime and impose new ones for as long as it takes. How are you? The G7 stands. Uh, strongly in support of you, as does Canada. A message Prime Minister Justin Trudeau delivered directly during a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Zelensky on the sidelines of the summit, their first in-person encounter since they met in Kyiv in May 2022. Zelensky also spoke with non-G7 nations, including a pivotal meeting with the Indian Prime Minister. Narendra Modi has described his friendship with Putin as unbreakable. In their meeting, Modi told Zelensky he understands the pain the war has caused Ukraine and pledged to do everything he can to help end it. The G7 statement also addressed climate change, nuclear disarmament and aid to poorer countries. Trudeau today met with leaders of non-G7 countries as his government pledged half a billion dollars over 25 years to help build green infrastructure and secure food supplies in the developing world. The leaders also called on China to use its influence over Russia to help end the war and cautioned Beijing against interference activities that undermine other countries' democracies, an issue of concern for Canada raised by Trudeau at a working dinner last night, according to Canadian sources. Here in Japan, Zelensky hopes to rally international support for his plan to borrow F-16 fighter jets from Western allies. The U.S., the U.K., and Canada are all on side, even if some fear it could cause a further escalation of the war. Heather. All right, Glenn McGregor in Hiroshima. As President Zelensky works to gain support abroad, in Ukraine, Russia's paramilitary group claims it has taken control of the eastern city of Bakhmut, with President Putin extending his congratulations. But as CTV's Drudy Trin reports, Ukrainian officials are deflecting that claim. One. The battle for Bakhmut has waged on for 292 days. Today, Russian private militia raised flags in victory over rubble. At noon, Bakhmut was completely taken, said the leader of the Wagner Group, but the claim was immediately disputed by Ukrainian forces, who say they control Bakhmut's outskirts. What cannot be denied is the status of Mariupol. The city fell one year ago after Ukrainian fighters holed up in the Azovstal steel plant surrendered. The Kremlin boasted on Twitter of its rebuilding efforts, new apartments and hospitals. We're very happy that there's peace in Mariupol, says this resident. 
happened in the capital, a march of defiance in remembrance of the estimated 20,000 civilians killed in Mariupol. We're here to remind people about these boys and for those who are in captivity to be free, says this demonstrator. Far from the battlefield, President Vladimir Zelensky pressed on the diplomatic front, securing permission from the U.S. for its European allies to supply Ukraine with F-16 jets. Thanks to our partners, it really will help our society, our people. So it takes a long time to train a pilot, not just to fly it, but to fight it. So this is still testing the waters. G7 leaders also impose new sanctions. Along with targeting Russian banks, oil and gas companies, the new penalties will hurt those who support Moscow's war. This human rights lawyer says the sanctions are working. They're fixing that enforcement gap. They're looking at all those people that have typically helped evade sanctions by um, uh, look, targeting them specifically as well. Sanctions have shrunk Vladimir Putin's war chest. More than $440 billion of Russia's central bank assets have been frozen. Heather. Judy, thank you. A provincial state of emergency remains in effect in Alberta tonight, where crews are struggling through another hot, dry weekend. This early and intense wildfire season has already scorched more than 800,000 hectares. Last year on this day, we burned just 459 hectares. Not 459,000, 459. That means the burned area is nearly 2,000 times last year's. And while weather conditions have been a challenge for firefighters, the forecast is offering some hope. A front moving into the province tomorrow is expected to bring much-needed cooler temperatures and rain. What we'd like to see is a long, steady rain that will soak into the forest and into the ground. Nearly 11,000 evacuees are still waiting for the all-clear to return home. With a provincial fire ban in place, the tradition of gathering around a May-long weekend campfire is out of bounds for Albertans this year. But as CTV's Mark Villani reports, holiday campers in the Rocky Mountains are making the best of a tough situation. It's a smoky drive west to the mountains from Calgary, but once you arrive, the haze dissipates at local campgrounds in the Bow Valley. It's a sweet escape for these families, but the risk of wildfires is still imminent. Well, we don't want any fires to happen anywhere because our resources are too valuable. And we don't want anybody to get hurt or displaced by their family. So you got to follow the rules 100%. It's honestly not much different because you still have propane fires and it's still really fun. It's why these campers are using propane tanks instead, setting them up close together for warmth when it gets cold and cooking without the use of flames. They're making the most of it despite a province-wide fire ban. We miss the smell of a good old campfire, but certainly don't mind not worrying about the spreading of other wildfires in this area here. The flames have destroyed more than 200 structures in northern Alberta. More than 10,000 people are still away from their homes. A spark that caught to that would catch that one on fire pretty easily. Mo Saunders is a school teacher by profession. She's hoping to educate these kids on the importance of following fire restrictions. It could spread to other trees, sparks could fly around, and it could, like, you could make more fires. Uh, I think it's important because, like, as you can see, it's really hot now, and, the t and that makes everything super dry, so it could easily become a wildfire in, like, split seconds. <laughs> But it's not just a ban on campfires. The province is also banning off-road recreational vehicles and mountain bikes for fears of sparks flying. Recreation was the second most common cause of fires in Alberta from 2006 to 2018, trailing only behind lightning. May Long Weekend is one of the busiest weekends for human-caused fires, but this group is doing its part to stop that from happening. We get to be here still enjoying our weekend, and we're not worrying about our homes being unsafe. So I think we can do our part. Mark Villani, CTV News near Kananaskis. A massive apartment fire in Winnipeg has left up to 180 people without a home. Flames broke out on the fourth floor of the building yesterday evening. All of the tenants made it out safely. A firefighter was taken to hospital in stable condition. The cause of the fire is under investigation. Winnipeg police have, for the first time, shut down a magic mushroom dispensary despite a push to supply the public with the illegal hallucinogenic. As more shops pop up across the country, some believe it's a medical necessity, while authorities call it 
drug trafficking. CTV's Manitoba Bureau Chief Jill Makashan reports. Winnipeg police went into the Magic Mush dispensary with a search warrant last night, seized the product and arrested two people. You can't be selling these. This is drug trafficking. That's all this is. The storefront had been operating for a week with customers keen on buying the product. I think it's about time. It's about time. Yeah, 100%. Uh, there's enough research and evidence out there to support this as a viable medicine for a lot of people. The active ingredient in magic mushrooms is a chemical called psilocybin, a hallucinogen that some research shows in small doses can treat a variety of mental health disorders, including depression. Psilocybin falls under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, so without special authorization from Health Canada, selling, possessing and producing it is illegal. I think what they should be doing is, is looking at regulating psilocybin um, and putting in rules so that these, these stores sell a safe product to only people who have a doctor's note. Still, a number of stores across Canada are openly selling magic mushrooms to anyone who wants them, including this one in London, Ontario. The store has 10 locations across the province. Some have been shut down by police, but open again hours later. The police laid charges. Police went away, they opened the next day and they continued on. And we're hopeful that the Manitoba experience will be similar. Winnipeg police say it will not. We may or may not be executing uh, warrants elsewhere and this may be an interprovincial drug investigation moving forward. Police are advising anyone who purchased product from this store to dispose of it or bring it to the nearest police station. The man and woman arrested here on Friday are expected to face drug trafficking charges. Jill Makishan, CTV News, Winnipeg. An unsettling seizure of police uniforms in Cape Breton is drawing public outrage, renewing concerns after the way police paraphernalia was used during Nova Scotia's mass shooting. They haven't learned a damn thing. It's, uh, they, I lost both my parents to the idiot dressed as a cop, and you're, you're still getting copycats. Officers found what's believed to be authentic police uniforms and equipment during a recent search. A 30-year-old man is facing multiple charges, including one under the Police Identity Management Act, a new provincial law developed in response to the deadly rampage three years ago when a gunman masquerading as an RCMP officer killed 22 people. Princess Anne offered praise to Canada's oldest continually serving military regiment amid a series of weekend events marking a milestone in New Brunswick. <music> Hundreds lined the streets for the 175th anniversary of the 8th Canadian Hazars Military Parade. Princess Anne praised the unit's remarkable history of service. Her Royal Highness was appointed Colonel-in-Chief more than a half a century ago. She returns to London tomorrow. Coming up, another attempt at peace in Sudan. The rush to save lives as a temporary ceasefire is declared. Plus, volcanic ash halts air travel in Mexico. The death toll from devastating floods in northern Italy has risen to at least 14 as crews search for anyone still trapped. Dramatic rescues as people stranded in their homes were evacuated with the help of boats and helicopters. More than 30,000 people are displaced and there is widespread damage to farmland. A red weather alert has been issued over the flood-ravaged region as rain could cause river levels to rise again. Air travel in and out of North America's largest city temporarily ground to a halt today. Volcanic ash in the air forced the shutdown of both international airports in Mexico City. Crews managed to remove the ash from the runway and get planes back in the air five hours later. A nearby volcano erupted earlier this week, sending a towering cloud of ash into the sky. In Sudan, warring military factions have agreed to a seven-day humanitarian ceasefire that will take effect on Monday. More than a million people are displaced, many growing hungry as aid groups try to scale up their efforts. Here's CTV's Chris Ashkate on those caught in the crossfire. The onslaught in Sudan has forced many to leave their homes, be killed in the crossfire, or die from extreme hunger. 
So far, nearly one million people are displaced, including more than 360,000 children. People are leaving Khartoum because there's no food, no water, no electricity, and there is very high levels of insecurity. This mother and her children fled after a missile hit their neighbor's home. We've never seen anything like it, the violence and the shooting. Bullets and shrapnel would hit our house, she said. In Khartoum, heavy airstrikes have destroyed much of the southern area. Fighting between rival military factions have stretched for more than a month, with both sides looking for a victory, no matter the cost. 1,000 people have now died from the violence. Fearing for their lives, Sana Mahmoud fled to Egypt with her two girls. She says her youngest keeps reliving the sounds of constant gunfire and airstrikes. My daughter still screams at night, asking me why are these people coming to kill us, she says. Three million children under five years of age have suffered from malnutrition this year alone, with this latest conflict only making the situation worse. It has further aggravated the already ongoing health and nutrition crisis, the water scarcity crisis, and it's deepened the learning crisis. The United Nations is calling for $3 billion in urgent humanitarian aid for more than half of Sudan's 46 million people in need. The UN said it's ramping up efforts across Sudan as more people are fleeing the country, but there are now multiple reports of armed men stealing supplies. Chris Nachkete, CTV News, Halifax. Helping vulnerable communities in this country has aspiring chefs cooking up a recipe for success. They're making a difference, serving healthy meals with a side of kindness and compassion. CTV's Vanessa Lee on a meaningful mission with all the right ingredients. It's all hands on deck for an order so large. The dishes are being prepared over a span of three days. From chicken a la king to carrot cake. Students at Montreal's Pearson School of Culinary Arts are making 3,000 meals. Meals that aren't a luxury, but a necessity. They're being delivered to the Native Friendship Centre of Montreal. We're going to be giving some out in the food baskets or to families in need. Uh, some we deliver, others will come to the centre and pick it up. With the price of food skyrocketing, the demand for meals has gone up. We can't even provide enough for everybody. I find. What you were in the store in here, not watching. Sebastian Papatens has been a cook at the Friendship Centre for 15 years. He is here helping students better understand the needs of the Indigenous community, especially the most vulnerable. A lot of the, our community members have uh, problems with their stomach, health problems, uh, and they're not fans of something spicy. So that was the main thing. But besides that, I think they're going to love it. It smells so good. These future professional cooks say they feel good knowing they are making a difference as they gain valuable experience in a high-volume kitchen. The main thing is making sure that every meal here is good so they will be able to eat and enjoy what we're able to produce. Cooks that have heart. Just as crucial, chef instructor Donna Colmanero says it's about playing a greater role in society. Giving back to whole communities, which is part of our professional relationships. It develops character, it makes them better cooks for our industries. Cooking for a cause as they try and give a little comfort to those who need it most. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. Still ahead, a WNBA star's emotional comeback to the court. The love from you know the fans when I came out was amazing. A standing ovation as Brittany Griner returns to the regular season. A tragic turn of events just hours before the second jewel of the Triple Crown. A horse was euthanized after suffering a catastrophic injury, a sport already reeling from eight recent fatalities leading up to the famed Kentucky Derby. The Preakness Stakes race still went ahead. Each is third, snatched from treasure, it's placing sevens, putting on a show, and the Preakness, who's it gonna be? It's gonna be national treasure. A thrilling finish as National Treasure denied Mage's bid for the coveted Triple Crown. The final leg, the Belmont Stakes, is set for June 10th, just outside New York City.
WNBA star Brittany Griner was back on the court in her first game of the regular season since being jailed in Russia. Griner scored 18 points for the Phoenix Mercury, happy to be with her team and grateful to once again stand for the U.S. national anthem. I was literally in a cage and could not stand the way I wanted to. Just being able to hear my, my national anthem, see my flag. Griner was in jail for nearly 10 months on drug-related charges. She was released in December as part of a high-profile prisoner swap. After the break, a whale of a time off the B.C. coast. The close encounter captured on camera. We leave you tonight with a surprise sighting orchestrated by a trio of marine mammals. The spectacular show caught on camera in BC provided an avid whale watcher with the thrill of a lifetime. Here's CTV's Abigail Turner. It was a mix of like terror, but exhilaration, like, oh my God, this is actually happening. Emotions Liam Brennan recalls after a once in a lifetime experience while kayaking off the coast in Vancouver last Wednesday. I heard the blow, which I suspected was a whale, but uh, immediately I told myself, there's no way. But his instinct was right. If I looked over my shoulder, and there was a huge dorsal fin on the horizon. What he first thought was one orca nearly a kilometer away quickly turned into an extraordinary experience, finding himself surrounded by a pod of three orcas. One male that kind of did a circle around me. There was a female on one side and two large. I, at one point I was surrounded, uh, which is just spectacular. He managed to capture the moment on his camera and posted the pictures online, helping to identify the killer whales as a mother and her two sons. Scientists that spend a lot of time around these whales can ID the individuals based on their dorsal fin, the white patch above their eye, and the gray area behind their dorsal fin. There's roughly 350 transient killer whales swimming in and out of the Salish Sea. A male orca can grow between six and nine meters long, more than triple the size of an average kayak. This is an extremely rare experience. Seeing a transient killer whale uh, from a kayak, it's like winning the lottery. And it raised its head right out of the water. Must have been 15 or 20 meters from my kayak. Um, so just unbelievable. The incredible moment was made even more special for Brennan, who now holds a UBC environmental science degree. For it to happen almost a week or just on, just over a week before I was graduating was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. I was pretty excited. A graduation gift from the Orcas and a special memory that will never be forgotten. Abigail Turner, CTV News, Vancouver. What an experience and stunning photos. That is our show for this Saturday. I'm Heather Butts for Sandy and all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and we'll see you again tomorrow. CTV National News, Canada's number one newscast.